good afternoon for those of you in my time zone, and good morning, good evening to others. So I thought this is an interesting time, and thank you, Tara, for that nice introduction and in, in thinking about some of where digital health and digital mental health really is, what 2020 brought. It's been, from where I sit, a pivotal year. And I thought we could recap and talk about where we're at and then really where we're going. And I'll make a couple of predictions. I'll probably be wrong on all of them, but we'll see. So I want to anchor to a couple of key stats. 2020 and still 60% of people with mental health issues are not receiving any care. This is U.S.-based, but a lot of this extrapolates around the world. And 70 million Americans are suffering from a diagnosable behavioral health condition each year. So the numbers are staggering. And when we multiply that to places where access is even more limited than the United States and other countries, it, it's even exponential. So mental health in 2020, I should have added something for our election. But burnout, I remember early in the year, it seems like a long, long time ago, burnout became a legitimate diagnosis, coronavirus, and, and what's come with it. As for us, we've seen really about 125% growth, but it's less about what we're seeing in talk space and more about what we're seeing sort of the whole mental health ecosystem, which is a need that is unprecedented. And whether it's the pandemic and fears around it or that economic issue that sort of follows the pandemic in really part and parcel, the demand is huge. So how's everyone doing? How are people doing? So we're going to anchor to this. Small group, thriving. Everyone else, and it may be a little bit small now that I'm looking at the slide, surviving, struggling, and ailing. That is the largest percentage of people out. Life was pretty stressful before 2020. It is more stressful now. So what happened with COVID? We have, we've been in telehealth for quite a while. Telehealth has actually been around since the advent of the telephone. We'll talk about why the adoption is now. But these are some of the statistics that we've uncovered in the telehealth world and really extrapolating to the digital health world, which we're going to get into. And for purposes of this talk, I'm going to include telehealth along with digital health, and I'm going to explain what that ecosystem looks like. But 76% are interested in post-COVID, in telehealth, post-COVID-19. 74% like it. So people like it. What we found is providers the exception is the person who hasn't found a platform. So if you haven't found the platform, you're essentially not working. So whether it's been adopting your own platform, going to one of the consumer companies, going to an enterprise company, but really finding a way to get your clients online and provide care. And the question is, what will return and what will stick? And then we've seen a lot of regulatory reform, unprecedented. A lot of this is temporary, but in the United States, for example, Medicare, which is the coverage for our elderly, for people 65 and over, previously had only allowed very limited services in the digital and telehealth arena. It was by need. So if you were in a geographic area of high need, you were allowed to use it. Everyone else was really not reimbursed. Currently, they've waived that. So people are able to access care in really an unprecedented way. So what I don't have on here is digital health, but just to get a sense of the adoption curves of many of the devices and things that we've seen, right? What we all see and what you can tell from this cur these curves is whether it's the TV, the phone, is we hit the steep part. And clearly we're on the steep part of the digital health world. Question is, what curve will it look like over time? But we know that they're all going to raise to that 98% and they're peaking at about 98 or 99% there, all those curves. And we know that digital health is going to head and peak very high. Maybe it won't hit 99%. Maybe only 88% of people will use it. There'll be 10 or 12% who want only their health care bricks and mortar. But it is going to get there. So when I talk about the digital mental health landscape, I'm talking about a couple of different groups. What are they? Full software solution. So in my mind, that's a self-service software solution. So that could be a cognitive behavioral modular 
type program where someone logs on and goes through the modular programs for depression, for sleep, for anxiety. It could be something like Calm or Headspace, for those of you who are aware, so something that's a mindfulness program. Then we have an adjunctive technology, which is we're still providing live support. So it's a therapist, it's a psychiatrist, but there are tools around, embedded around what they're doing. The remote monitoring, so there we're thinking about devices. So are we tracking our sleep? Are we tracking our mood remotely, keystrokes, those type of things? Virtual visits, so my face on camera talking to one of my patients. Then finally, FDA-approved solutions. So while they may fall into any of the buckets outlined before, these are approved and prescribed. So it requires a prescription. So the FDA has vetted it, there have been clinical studies on it, and the FDA is now saying, well, now it can be prescribed. From where I sit sort of in that business medicine meld, what it allows is for formulary placement. In the United States, the payers, so the managed care organizations, are still the key drivers of our healthcare in a lot of ways, and we'll double click on that in a few moments. So where's the market? Where is digital health now? So I'm going to show this graph with some different axes in a moment. Well, what you see is scale, and then where are we on the continuum of care? So in terms of scale, things like full software-based solutions, and, and I did highlight some things just for effect so it's easier to read so some of the differences aren't as great or vast as they may look. But things like CCBT, cognitive behavioral therapy that's a fully software-based, and mindfulness, high scalability. But they're really for the lighter touch. So mindfulness is really a wellness. Not that mindfulness isn't valuable and, nor evidence-based. It's really a wellness type product. And that's where it's positioned in the market as a consumer type thing. So for example, Calm, I found out from American Express, they grant me access to Calm as an American Express card holder for free. So clearly being positioned downstream in terms of the acuity. Moving over a little bit, coaching apps. So in terms of coaching, there's, I'm going to really bucket a lot of different groups in there, but what it is is something short of a licensed professional. So they're usually receiving some sort of training. And I noticed that I didn't start sharing my video. I apologize. Is that there's tra they offer some sort of training, and you can become a coach. There are things, peers, which is a really a strong solution in the mental health ecosystem. Some companies have sort of taken it downstream quite a bit. I, I read recently about a company that's using listeners. I'm not really sure what that is. But it's someone who's not licensed, often providing some sort of care that is regimented, probably mostly cognitive behavioral-ish some sort of cognitive behavioral regimen. Your digital therapy, largest, that's what we provide. We like to think that it offers a lot in terms of continuum and scale, so definitely exaggerated for effect, but I guess my job, I'm biased. I'm clearly biased. But that's a way where there are lots of different ways to take licensed professionals, surround them with tools, and provide therapy at scale or provide care at scale. Um, digital therapeutics, also scalable. The reason it's lower is, and we'll talk about some of the barriers to adoption, are that it requires a prescription. So that really kind of puts it in the payer world. It limits use, and it requires really the psychiatrist in many cases to be aware of it, to know how to use it, and to want to use it. And then finally, tracking software, precision medicine. To me, very interesting. We haven't quite figured out where it fits in the ecosystem, so I sort of moved it all the way as a future stack. I think it's going to become integrated with many of what you're seeing on this graph or chart, but really not ready for prime time being used a lot in drug trials, but I'm not seeing a lot of real-world use or real-world benefit. So let's see it again. Now I've added evidence. So the question is, we're going to talk about this is, does the evidence support the type of tools that we have? And 
For things like CCBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, it absolutely does. There generally it's pretty well established that you can take cognitive behavioral therapy. It's been done for decades. I think I want to say since the 70s, where been able to have an assisted electronic cognitive behavioral therapy model. Mindfulness, while there is evidence, the question is, are apps like Calm and Headspace actually using the evidence, and do they have clinical evidence that it's effective? Um, in terms of things like digital therapeutics, digital therapy where we're using therapists, clearly effective. You might be saying, B&M, bricks and mortar, why do I have it down so low? Well, the question is, when's the last time you walked into a therapist's office and knew whether they were providing evidence-based therapy? Some are, some are not. I live in New York City where there are probably 20 therapists within two or three square blocks. And we're not really monitoring or tracking what their outcome is. I've never walked into anyone's office and seen their outcome. When I was at Optum, I didn't really have their outcomes. They weren't administering outcomes. We weren't able to track them in the same way. So while there are many who are providing great evidence-based care, it's really the Wild West. And therapy's really been behind the eight ball as had mental health care overall in terms of monitoring and evidence-based, especially for those in solo practice and small group practice. So what's the state? So what is evidence-based? Lots, everyone says, every digital application says, I have evidence-based care. Well, so there, as many of you are in the academic world, they've taken some studies, they've taken some accepted care and translated to their app. Does that mean that their app is effective? Does it have efficacy? Less clear. Many have not studied the efficacy of what they're doing. If they have, it's a white paper or it's not released. And there are very, very few studies. So the current state of digital mental health research, to me overall, if I had to grade it, would be a C minus. There's not enough, we're not doing enough, we're not demanding enough, and there are a host of reasons why. Okay. Some of the reasons are as simple as it's expensive for new companies, especially small companies, wanting to do a proof of concept for them to put research together especially large research. So people often ask about randomized control trials. Randomized control trials take a long time and are expensive, as many of you well know, and grants are hard to come by for a new company. But also, you can write an app, you can release it on the app store, and you don't really need evidence to release it. And then it becomes a marketing endeavor to get people to use it. So for a direct-to-consumer type, app, and there are probably hundreds, if not thousands, it's been published extensively, there's not a lot of barrier to entry, and there's not necessarily enough policing of whether what they're doing is evidence-based, is it effective, what the efficacy is, and it's being released. And then on sort of the enterprise side, from a payer perspective, there's probably a little bit more scrutiny, but do we want insurance companies to be the gatekeeper of evidence-based medicine? Um, definitely a question for dialogue. Um, just to give you an example of research that we do, so this took us a long time to get to. We had to be around for almost seven or eight years till we had this, and we looked at 10,700 people who had care on Talkspace. I still get challenged and say, but it's not a randomized control trial. It's a retrospective. It's a look back, and absolutely right. But at this point, for a company like ours, this is what we were able to create, and we're probably one of the leaders in the digital health research arena. And this was hard for us and took a long time. So trying to figure out how do we get companies in the research arena, how do we move them forward, how can we better do that, and how much do we demand that is very important. So that's sort of where we are in 20 large adoption, both on the consumer side, on the payer side. Research, work in progress, what are the best tools, less clear. Where are we going? I think we're really at the tip of the iceberg and it's really where we're at. So where are we going? What does 21 hold? So what we've done is started to do is put consumers more in the driver's seat. Um, when I trained as a psychiatrist, medicine was I told someone when to come to my office, how often to see me, and what to take. And that was treatment, paternalistic. Consumers are now sitting in the driver's seat because they have so much choice where they access their care, 
what care they access, especially if you're willing to pay out of pocket for those who can afford it, what care looks like for them. Enterprises, businesses are moving into the wellness space and really almost the clinical space and are looking at things, whether it's offering something like a calm or headspace to their employee, or even therapy. We have businesses that want to offer therapy to their employees. We've even had businesses say, I'm thinking of offering psychiatry, prescription medication, outside of their covered benefit insurance or state insurance for free. And then finally, still, payers are making large decisions, still sort of the gorilla in the So the shift, the paradigm is, is different. And while many people, when you say what is treatment, we think about someone sitting in an office or maybe sitting on video. It's something different to people, to consumers. It may be breathing exercises that they can access themselves when they're feeling stressed. It may be an electronic journal. It may be a combination of two or three different apps and an in-person treatment provider. So the paradigm is changing as consumers really have some degree of choice and can choose their own health. And mental health starts to look like a continuum. People are going to move between different levels of care throughout their ecosystem. Calm may be enough for me today. Now I'm moving in. My depression has returned, and now I'm scheduling a video. I'm doing pretty well, still not sleeping that well. Maybe I don't need medication. I'm now going to do some modules on sleep and get through an eight-week program on sleep. And it's going to be a full stack, and we're going to navigate through it in time. Navigators on the health insurance side in the U.S. will help people navigate, but people are going to take more control over their care. So what's quality? My opinion has changed over time. So clearly outcomes are important in quality. We want good outcomes. But one of my messages for today is you can't have quality without engagement, so it can't just be about outcomes. One of the things that we want to overcome is that the modal number, most common number of sessions people go to are one in mental health. That hasn't changed. It seems to be studied every 10 or so years. The average number is still about 1.8 sessions, maybe 1.75 sessions, so people aren't going. So if we are not providing a good experience, we can't get the quality. So I've sort of moved away from outcomes being the only piece of the grail and moved to a real meld where outcomes are probably a larger piece, but the experience is important. So whether it's a bricks and mortar practice and you're going in and the office has to look nice, a little bit less interesting, but in the digital world where we can optimize for both outcomes and the experience, by a having time. We track how long it takes the provider to respond. We have expectations for when responses will come in and we're able to track it. So it's not someone's going to get back to you when they get back to you. It's we, we have an SLA, so we have an expectation, and we track it. And when someone doesn't get back to a client in the time they're supposed to, that affects their ability to practice on our platform. And we need to figure out, and you leverage the digital platform. And whether you're a bricks and mortar provider or someone in the digital world, you're going to need a platform. So that office-based psychiatrist or therapist is going to have to find in time a platform that allows them to provide care. And the platform may right now be just a video interface, but in time it's going to need to do more to really engage their client because you're not going to be able to say, I provide good outcomes anymore without actually providing good service and really trying to attack that modal number being one and move that to a point where people are actually in treatment long enough to do well. Other trends. We're finally getting to a point where we're collecting enough data to do some interesting things with it. So we can have predictive models. I'll highlight one or two that we've worked on and rolled out. One we've published on I'll highlight is, trying to see if it's here, is risk tool where it is reading the chat between the therapist and client, everything is transcribed, and notifying a therapist when it detects elevated risk in the room with a pointing towards a risk assessment. So the therapist can then go to that room and conduct a risk assessment if needed. The goal is to identify crisis before it becomes a crisis by linking patterns in the data 
and building a model based on, in this case, I think 1,500 different rooms, and then continuously iterating on it to really make it really specific, decrease the false negatives, increase the positivity rate. And we're seeing AI, I put here just because it's a term people use, AI means different things to different people. Machine learning is really starting to pay some dividends. I sort of outlined how we use it, but the goal is, is by, un by increasing understanding, we can improve care, we can provide feedback to the provider, which increases that engagement, which, as I mentioned, is very important, identify risk, and then it's a flywheel. So it's going and it's getting more specific and better with each iteration. And then the other thing is data is going to start to be an expectation. So for that person around the corner from me, they're going to need a platform where they can provide data because a lot of the apps and companies in the space have data and are starting to provide it to in the enterprise world. Data becomes an expectation and you should know, are you driving outcomes? It's going to be part of your value proposition. So let me end with a quick crystal ball for 2021, and maybe we could revisit this next year and see that I'm wrong on all of them. Things to think about. One, consolidation is already starting. What we're going to see are established players expand their stack and really have the ability for clients coming in to move among various levels of care. So it's going to be the live providers with the self-service. Consumer-driven mental health. It's going to continue. It's going to expand. Data, thing. we're going to see machine learning advancement in the next year or two that will start to move the needle. AI, so things like chatbot therapists, they're incremental. They are not ready for prime time. I think we are five years away from really having a really good chatbot therapist or something functional. We're going to see more growth in digital therapeutics. The question is, what will the adoption look like? It's a very appealing thing for investors and developers because it gives them a way into a formulary, but we haven't seen usage patterns increase. Unclear if we will, but there are more companies going for that FDA approval. But here are the things we need to be wary of, that still the enterprise landscape payers drive the long term for now. People will return to bricks and mortar treatment. The question is, what portion? We haven't moved past access as the goal which ties into that we're still insufficient momentum around research and outcome. So right now, many of the payers, many of the employers are solving for access, so they're less focused on the research. That will shift in time. It's unclear that it will shift this year, especially because of the pandemic and the need. And then we're in what I think could be the golden age of mental health. Since Freud, really, we haven't had innovation like this. And I think the next two to three years, we will have some really interesting solutions, whether it's precision medicine, whether it's tracking tools that really go mainstream and become part and parcel with how we receive our care.